want to welcome everybody to this holistic plan webinar navigating 2021 your updated tax return review checklist my name is ben birkin i'm the vice president for customer success and engagement here at holistic plan joined by roger pine the founder of holistic plan who has one more acronym after my name which makes him a better person thank you you're welcome um for folks who don't know, uh, Roger and I actually used to do a podcast for financial advisors called Zebra Smash. And I think it was our 10th episode, Roger, where we did basically like the, the very, very rough sketch of what we're going to do today with just two guys reading a tax return. So if you can imagine what you're going to see here, but an audio only version, it was epic. It was epic. That was, and and it was. It surprised us how popular it was. People were going back to it years later. And and honestly, I would say you could definitely draw a direct line between the unexpected popularity of that podcast episode and the existence of Holistic Plan as a company today. It really opened our eyes as to how much people are looking for a repeatable way to go through this incredibly valuable document. Um, repeatable and also complete because there's so much richness there for you. And so that's what we're, that's what we're doing today. Same thing, but with visuals this time. Absolutely. So what we're going to talk about today, it's going to be more educational, completely product agnostic. Uh, given the amount of material that we have to cover, we're not sure how much time there's going to be for questions, but we're going to try to hit a few if there is time. We do have two Holistic Plan colleagues, Griffin and Carrie. They are running the chat and are going to be able to answer a lot of product questions for you. Um, but we encourage you to reach out via the website if you're interested in becoming a list of plan subscriber or if you're already a subscriber, feel free to reach out to support or check your dashboard for upcoming webinars that are going to be more product focused. If you provided us a CFP candidate ID when you signed up, we'll be submitting the attendance following this call so you get your CE credit. As always, uh, Holistic Plan Premium subscribers are going to be able to watch a recording of this presentation and then take a quiz on our website for CE credit and we're continuing to build out our library of CFP, CE eligible tax presentations there. Um, but beyond that, just a recording of the webinar and a link to the checklist that we're gonna be talking about are gonna be available and sent to everyone who signed up within a day or two. So again, last time we are recording it, we'll send out a link. Um, but with that, without further ado, Roger, let's jump into how folks might go about taking a, a more systematic approach to reviewing 2021 tax returns. The way that we organize this is, again, unlike the, uh, the podcast version, which was just us reading a tax return, we're going to have a sample return up on the screen so that we can talk through any of the things that we're referring to as we go down kind of our comments, almost like a schedule, schedule by schedule version, right? Does that seem like a reasonable start to the tour, Roger? Let's do it. Let's do it. All yeah. Right. So here we are, the always popular 1040. Um, even before we get to line one, of the 1040, there are things that you're going to want to check, particularly for clients that you've been working with for a long time, but also just for prospects. That's just going to be filing status, dependence, and you know this one new one, which I'll I'll highlight here. I think this is this is brand new in 2021, right? Uh, 2020 was the first year. It used to be at the top of Schedule One, and then in 2020 they moved up even before they ask you about your children. Before you even reveal the names of your children, they want to know, did you own any cryptocurrency, virtual currency? <laughs> That's the question they've asked first. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That is um, unbelievable, right? So we can already get a sense of uh, the importance of... Then someone asked if you can zoom in. I don't know if that's doable here or not. Um, I can try. I can do my best. If y'all want to follow... I mean, if y'all want to follow through just on the side, Google form 1040 and you can have it up on your screen. We're mostly just talking about lines and things like that. So if he's not able to zoom in, uh, yeah. just Google 1040. And as we move to schedule one, two, three, you can grab those as well on your, on your local machines. Let me try that. Roger, why don't you go ahead and start going through some of the other parts on here as we're. Sure. Well, I mean, so some of the things that you have to watch for, um, obviously filing status, uh, is, is important there. Um, on the dependents, one thing that you'll notice in 2021, they did not break out dependents by children under six versus over six, even though the child tax credit is based on that. Um, so that's something that you're going to have to look at Form 88, uh, Schedule 8812 for. Oh, that's zoomed in. There you go. That might be a little too much, right? It's a, that's, that's big. That's better. Okay. Uh, that's probably as big as we're going to be able to get it, I'd say. Yes. 
So yeah, on, on the depends, we, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to check for accuracy and we're trying to look for planning opportunities because planning opportunities, because that's how we make, you know, that's how we prove our worth to clients. But if you don't capture what you did properly, if the accuracy isn't there, it never happened. And so you're going to hear really basic things like, yeah, we recommend you check that the number of dependents is correct, but that's still something that we're able to do. We know this client better than that CPA who has 5,000 individual tax returns they're filing. So it's up to us to, to also check for accuracy, even these super basic things as we go. That's so, right. Yeah, sorry. No, that's good. So, you know, kind of moving down, folks that might be filing, I think one of the things we mentioned is, you know, there's a difference between Form 1040 and Form 1040 SR, right, which are going to be more simplified things for senior filers. So identifying just the form itself, right? Are, are your clients using the right form? And if it's brand new to them, is it going to be something where they might need, you might need to spend a little bit more time walking them through the 1040 SR because things line up a slightly different way than the traditional 1040. Um, yep. But as we start going through our, our numbers and our rows, and I should point out, we're not going to talk about every single row, right? You could construct a checklist that says, look at every single row. Um, that's not really helpful. So we're just going to try to hit the, the most important things that a, a planner is going to want to pay attention to. And the checklist we're providing does actually go, go into that level yeah. of detail if you really want to get into it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, line one, straight up, what are wages, right? Does this match with what we think about? And then if you have somebody's W-2, are there opportunities for maxing out 401k, 403b, 457 contributions, right? That's going to be a primary driver for that sort of thing. Um, working our way down just the income row, you know, taxable interest and dividends, you know, this breakout between tax exempt interest and taxable interest, that's going to be important when you're thinking about portfolio optimization, really both of these lines, right? Row two and three can factor into, do we have a portfolio that is as tax efficient as it could be? Um, both in terms of creating qualified dividends for a preferential rate, but also just this breakout between 2A and 2B of tax exempt and taxable interest sometimes getting away from the idea that you never want to pay any taxes, right? Tax exempt interest can be good, but it's not always good for folks in lower tax brackets where their after tax yield might actually be better on a taxable bond versus a municipal bond. They might be giving up more yield than they need to if they're in a lower bracket. Yeah. Yep. So really we're looking at portfolio efficiency with uh, those two rows. Um, when we get to row four, this is where stuff gets super fun. If it hasn't already gotten fun, totally, uh, <laughs> <laughs> We're looking at IRA distributions, right? A lot of stuff can go onto this row, right? It doesn't just have to be your required minimum distribution because this is where stuff like rollovers are going to be reported, Roth IRA conversions, qualified charitable distributions. That's probably one of the bigger ones, right? So, Rod, do you want to talk a little bit about you know things that people need to be looking for in this row? Well, this is such a good example of you. You may lead your client through the best planned strategy last year you did the qcd or you did a rollover and if you're if you've been in this game long enough you have seen the tax preparer screw that up the qcd is not reported on the 1099r and that's so that's information that has to be provided to the tax preparer the tax preparer has to make sure that they enter that it gets lost and so they may report it as taxable so despite your best efforts to create a tax-free withdrawal from the ira if they report it as taxable, you didn't get any benefit for your client. Your rollovers, if that ended up showing up as taxable, I think that's maybe a little bit easier to get right if the if the documentation all happens. But I think we've seen it. So yeah. this is a critical, critical place. And so, you know, it's it's the onus is kind of on us during the year, during the year 2021. I hope that we were recording what we did. And then if we're sending out tax letters to CPAs now or to tax preparers now, uh, I hope we're recording like, hey, they did a QCD, but then it, it really didn't happen until we're back here in May and we're checking that it actually got recorded properly. Right. So, you know, the big 30,000 foot view of this is our 4A and 4B equal, right? Is our total distribution yeah. and our taxable amount equal? And if they're not, why not? Well, if Do they we are, yeah. Why not? yeah. <laughs> are they equal? Or should they not be equal? Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Fun coin flip. Uh, so yep. pensions and annuities, again, we've got a component where it's going to be total versus taxable. Um, sometimes those are going to be equal, but sometimes if an annuity is coming from a non-qualified annuity, there might be some excluded amount that's effectively a return of basis that wouldn't get counted on the taxable side. 
So again, trying to measure these two things and are things showing up the way that we would expect them to. Uh, similarly, although there's no uh, control, less control over this, I suppose, but row 6A, when we're talking about social security benefits, not all of your social security is taxable. At most, 85% of it is taxable. Um, but we'll still see, and this is the benefit or the curse of seeing thousands of uploaded returns, particularly on returns that people have done themselves, as opposed to having a professional do them. This calculation is not easy, right? It's easy with software, but if people are doing this on their own outside of software, this is a common error spot. All the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a super easy thing, especially if your client is filling it in by hand and you have a few of those, definitely check that social security line. They, they screw it up. Probably more times than not. Would you say so, Ben? Maybe I'm being unfair, but. Well, I mean, if more times than not is 50% plus one, then yes. Yes. Yeah. They, they, <laughs> more, yeah, they screwed up more than they get it right. Yeah. And Ben, I'm, I'm just going to go back to QCDs real quick because someone right. asked the question about that. I just want to be super, super clear. As far as I know, your 1099, if you do a QCD, your 1099R will consider that to be a taxable distribution. Yes, because the is. custodian does not know any differently. They don't want to the report it. The custodian does not want to take a position as to whether or not that charity was uh, eligible or not for a QCD treatment. And so it's your, uh, well, it's your client's obligation ultimately to report to their tax preparer that this was a QCD. And then the tax preparer has to make that determination that it indeed was. So I, someone was asking, like, what's the deal with that? And so I just want to make it totally clear. Yeah, the 1099R is not going to help you on QCDs. No, and it won't help your C It won't help your client CPA if they don't know, because if all they get is the 1099R, that's all they're going to read. They're not going yeah. to assume either, right? So some of the better tax organizers are now getting at asking clients about this. But let's be honest, and hopefully no, none of my clients are listening. Clients don't remember, right? You know, most clients don't remember to tell their CPAs, "No, I actually did a charitable contribution, but out of my IRA distribution." And almost every year you see something show up on your Schedule A, which we'll talk about, that you know came out of an IRA and doesn't belong on a Schedule yep. A, right? So Then, then a, a clarification on the Social Security one. Someone said, yeah. is it always 85%? No, all no. I'm is like, it's wrong if it's 100%. If, if, <laughs> if, you're, if your client who's filling in their own tax return puts 100% of the Social Security as taxable, you know that's wrong. And that's the error we see more often than not with people uploading returns. It could certainly be less than 85% taxable. Yeah, it's, it's actually a very complicated, it's not, it's not a straightforward uh, answer. It could be zero, it could be 50, yeah. it could be 85, but it will never be more than 85%. Correct. Yep. Right. Okay. Uh, so row seven, we're at capital gains. You know, this is going to be just a clue, right? If there's a negative number on here, that's helpful to know, important to know, not just for losses for the current year, but knowing that there might be carry forward losses to use in future years. If the number is really big, particularly relative to other income, um, especially if this is a prospect, there's some questions I think that you want to ask. Was that a one-time event? Does that happen all the time? What were the nature of those losses? Um, one thing that we'll see a lot again, because we see so many returns, but the little checkbox next to row seven, if you see that checked, that's going to mean that all of your capital gains or all of your clients' capital gains are coming from mutual fund distribution. So you wouldn't expect to see a Schedule D in that case. Um, just a little side note there. Ben, um, if people ask the name of your cat, you might want to drop that information sometime. That was Marble. Marble, got it. Okay. He's a, he's a big fat one. There's his brother, Pete, is a little bit more slender. They eat the same food, so I'm not quite sure what's going on there. But all right. continue. All right, so row eight, this is where we start pulling in other schedules, right? And you're going to see that throughout the tax return. As we've simplified it over the last few years, all we've done is simplified it and just made things more complicated later on, and we just bring in that one number here. So row eight is where we're bringing in items from schedule one, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, when we get to line nine, we've added everything up, right? That's our total income number. Interestingly, that doesn't mean anything, right? <laughs> By itself as a number has no implication anywhere on your tax return other than it's nice to know. Because when we get to line 10, it's when we start doing what used to be called above the line deductions. That's back when the adjusted gross income was actually the last thing on this page. Um, that's not the same anymore. It's still referred to as above the line de deductions, but these are things that reduce your income to your adjusted gross income. And we'll talk about specific things that go into that as we get to schedule one. But your AGI, that's a big one, right? That's a big number to, to be mindful of because that's going to key a lot of other things, eligibility for certain things, phase outs of certain things. Unfortunately, those phase outs and those 
tax consequences and those credit availability, it's not just one AGI number, is it? The answer is no. Oh, I didn't know you're if that little, was a rhetorical you're, question. You're a little slow. <laughs> Sorry, no? <laughs> Correct. Yeah, the answer is no. So there's uh, this concept of modified adjusted gross income or MAGI, which again, sounds pretty straightforward. You're just modifying it, except that there's no uniform definition of that. We've got both folks who are holistic plan users know that we've got a list of various planning opportunities that are governed by this, but the MAGI calculations themselves, there's at least seven different ones. Right? We list them all on the checklist that everybody will get, but the MAGI for determining your net investment income tax eligibility is actually different than your Roth contribution eligibility, which is different than the Medicare surcharge situation. So you know, being mindful of all these things, it's almost impossible to keep them all in your head. You got to have some sort of reference for understanding these different things and what applies and what doesn't apply. Yeah. And it, so, so, you know, we're, we're not trying to do a commercial for holistic plan here. This is a, this is meant to be continuing education and credit, but if you're truly building out a tax return review process, uh, I highly recommend that if you don't use software, you need to build your own little spreadsheet or something like that. That's going to allow you to calculate those magis because a lot of things do phase in and out based on what your MAGI is. And so if you're going to try to provide complete advice to a client and they're anywhere near some of those phase outs, you're just going to need to know, you know, what the actual real numbers are. And it's not given to you anywhere on the return. You're going to have to calculate it. Yeah. I'll throw out one that I always, I come back to because it is one that, you know, we see questions about a lot, but your Roth contribution eligibility, right? Most folks are familiar with what that number needs to be. But the actual calculation of that number tells you to strip out any Roth conversions that you did. So if you did a $500,000 Roth conversion, that amount doesn't actually get added into whether or not your client was eligible to do a Roth contribution in the year. And that blows people's minds. And by people, I mean me. Yeah, um, we're people. Blew my mind. Okay. So uh, we've gotten to adjusted gross income. Row 12 is where we start getting into additional deductions. So this is either you're branching to the standard deduction or the itemized deduction, whichever is bigger. Um, we'll go over schedule A, which is where those standard or those itemized deductions are listed in a little bit. But you know, your clue here is, did they take the standard? Did they take the, uh, did they itemize? And what, what information can I draw from that for planning for the current year, right? Um, row 12B, this is going to be unique to 2021 as far as we know right now, but this is where you were able to do a small charitable deduction, if, even if you took the standard deduction, right? So slight increase above what was available in 2020, but they've moved it, right? So this used to be below the line, now it's above the line. Yeah, flipping. Um, I'm it sorry, above the line, now it's below the line, now it's below the line, thank you. And yeah, I think it doubled, right? So it's available at 600 bucks for, for married filers, married yep. filing jointly and 300 for single filers. Yep. Uh, when we get to row 13, this is the qualified business income deduction. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but just its existence is important for folks to know because that's going to be a clue of either, sometimes it's, it's uh, usually it's self-employment income or something coming from a Schedule C, but you still could see this even if there was no self-employment income, right? Because it's available for REIT dividends and things like that. Hey, Ben, real quick on 12B, I, I yep. think the only like real thing we as planners need to look at is if they took the standard and there's nothing in line 12B, you at least bring it up with them. Like it's probably not worth refiling. I, if they're refiling for something else and then for whatever reason, and you're like, look, if you can just find $600 of donations, let's throw that in there as well. Otherwise, it's probably not worth even refiling, even if they're like, oh yeah, I gave 600 bucks to my church or whatever. Yeah, it's it's just the standard refile amended return, even if that's like 300 bucks, you know, right. you gotta be in a pretty high tax bracket for the <laughs> yeah. deduction to be worth yeah, the refiling. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's kind of a stretch, but, and because it's a one-year thing, you can't even really turn it into a planning recommendation. So it's just really something, if they take the standard and there's another reason to refile, highlight that. That's about all you can do. Yep. Uh, so when we get to row 15 at the very bottom, that's our taxable income. And that's a big number, right? This is adjusted gross income is a big number, but taxable income, that's the thing that pretty much your taxes are based off of. And this breakdown between ordinary income and investment income, you know, that's kind of where we see this branching effect. So important to keep in mind, um, if this is low enough, this is potentially your planning opportunity or thinking about the current year, because if this is below, I think it's $80,800 for 2021, 
any element of that that consisted of long-term capital gains or qualified dividends actually gets a 0% tax treatment. So if we're expecting yep. 2022 and 2021 to be similar, potentially some opportunities to harvest gains at a 0% rate, rate yep. at least for the federal level. Okay. All right. Uh, then we get to everybody's favorite number, row 16, line 16. That's how yes. much you got to pay tax on, right? And there's some, you know, a couple of check boxes here for things like if there's kitty tax or if there's a tax on a um, lump sum distribution, you'll see these check boxes marked. But this is going to be your starting point for here's how much money you have to pay until we start getting into things like row 19, where we're talking about uh, non refundable credits, right? Or I'm sorry, row 17, that's pulling in the non refundable credits. No, that's other taxes. My apologies. We're still on the tax part. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah. we're adding other taxes that are coming in from Schedule 2, which we'll talk about in more detail a little bit. But then we start getting into a few of these other non-refundable credits, right? Which themselves are going to be summed up somewhere else, right? On Schedule yep. um, Schedule 3. Schedule 3, right? We get to row 24, right? So row 24 is our total tax. And even from that, that's not going to truly be your total tax, right? In some cases, right? So you take your tax, you take your non-refundable credits, and that gets you to total tax. But then from total tax, you can apply your refundable credits, which will be things, at least for last year, like the refundable child tax credit or American Opportunity Credit or the recovery rebate credit, which is what we start seeing in rows, you know, the, the high 20s, low 30s, right? Anything we want to add about that, Roger, other than we shouldn't expect to see row 29 show up in 2022 or really row 28. Which yeah, are the... because, yeah, well, we don't know. But yeah, at present, some of those refundable credits go back to being non-refundable again. Or disappearing entirely. Right. Right. So like the, the American opportunity, the um, recovery rebate credit, yeah. God willing, does we're not hoping exist. For the, we're hoping for no need for that again, yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So then we come down to you know the, the summation of it all. How much did you pay? Do you have to pay more? Or did you pay too much and you got a refund? And those two things are uh, additional clues, right? If you paid too much and you got a refund, planners are trained to think that's an interest-free loan to the government, right? And so is there something that we need to do to adjust withholding or um, something like that so you're not giving your money away for free? This has been compounded, though, by just how long it's taken the IRS to do some of these returns where refunds were pushed way out beyond the tax filing deadline. Right. So, you know, towards the end of 2021, people were still getting their refunds from the 2020 tax year. Um, but the flip is also true. If you owe a big dollar amount and you actually have to pay and there's estimated penalties associated with that, you want to be thinking about what are we going to do differently this year to avoid that next year? Right. right. So here we are. Here's part of our first schedule, schedule one. Schedule one is going to be additional income and adjustments to income. Again, we're not going to go through everything but just being mindful of taxable refunds from state. And that's gonna be something to be just aware of. And is there something withholding related that you might wanna do there? Because a state, tax, a state refund is actually taxable at the federal level because you, you got a deduction for it in the year that you generated it. Um, alimony received, this is still gonna show up on tax returns even though the rules changed, but it's because if you were divorced prior to 2019, this is actually an income item. After 2019, alimony payments aren't deductible anymore. Um, but so you still might see numbers show up here for pre-2019 divorces. Business income, so row three, this is going to be referencing again separately, Schedule C. So if there's something in here, we know there's going to be a Schedule C that we're probably going to want to pay attention to. Um, anything else on here, Roger, that we want to specifically call out? Um, did you want to, let's see. Uh, well, new to 2021, line eight, all those breakouts, um, That's that used to be like all mushed into one line. And so we actually have a little bit more information than we used to, although a lot of this stuff's pretty obscure stuff. So I would just say as an advisor, if you see any values in those line eight, any of those line eights, that's probably worth a conversation. I think one of them was like for Olympic medals, like line eight yeah. L, line eight L, right? Uh, so yeah. far I've heard we're not doing well in the winter Olympics, but you know, maybe, <laughs> um, but um, this was, there was this one about- last year. So. If you look at 8E, actually, that's your tax bill HSA. Yeah, issue. that's a big one. And it's just like, if you see that, you know, hopefully you were, you knew that that was happening when it did, because that's money coming out of an account. But if not, like, that's a conversation. It, it just allows us to kind of see 
Is there something kind of goofy that we didn't expect to see an income item from? Ben, are we going to talk about Schedule C and E? Just yeah, we'll of- get there as we go through okay. um, the actual return. But yeah, so rows three and rows five reference Schedule C and E respectively. So if you see them on here, that's just going to be, hey, we're going to have to pay attention to some stuff related to Schedule C and E. Uh, the next part of this page, though, so that is additional income. The second part of Schedule 1 is adjustments to income. So these are those formally referred to as above-the-line adjustments, so things like health savings account deductions, contributions to self-employed plans, uh, anything related to self-employment that's going to show up on rows 15, 16, and 17 for the various deductions for self-employment tax, um, health care contributions, retirement plan contributions. Um, your IRA deduction is going to show up here on schedule on line 20. Um, and then the student loan interest deduction, that's still going to be there. But the fact that so many of those, I mean, all of those were deferred for a good chunk of 2021, unlikely that you're going to see anything on here because folks just didn't have to pay. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. Right? Because you didn't have to pay. I don't know that you necessarily would have. So not quite sure uh, if there's going to be a lot of stuff on that row for, um, for last year. But um, even though you still accrue interest, I mean, you could have paid it, but you just didn't need to. I think, oh, I was, see. yeah. So, um, you know, one thing, if we're thinking about planning purposes, you know, the, the deductible part of self employment tax, that's going to be totally driven by whatever your schedule SE had. But if there's an entry for item 15, but not for 16 and 17, 16 being contribution to a retirement plan, 17 being health insurance deduction, just a clue to ask a question. Right. Why? There could be a good reason, right? If it's a side gig and you're getting your primary health insurance through that, then you're not going to get a deduction for self-employment insurance, health insurance for self-employed people. But there still could be an opportunity to make a retirement plan contribution. And maybe there's a different choice of vehicle based on what that income amount is. Right. And you can do your your comparison between SEPs and solo 401ks and that whole conversation. Yeah. Huge planning opportunity. And honestly, like if you have a prospect coming in, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we're flipping through tax returns. And that's like, it's such an easy win when you have a prospect in, in your room and at an initial meeting, Hey, I see you've got uh, self-employment tax, but you don't have a, you know, there, the reasons why they may not have it, but it's a good conversation starter. Yep. Absolutely. All right. So we get to schedule two. This is not a fun wait, 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 schedule one, two, oh, sorry, sorry, two sorry. things, Ben. Um, so one, um, we definitely see quite a bit. So line 13 is mm-hmm. the, mi- uh, we see that missed. The yeah. HSA deduction. In fact, the very first return ever uploaded to a Holista plan uh, was a had a missed HSA. It was, it was just a mistake on the on the part of the tax preparer. So that's definitely a place where, uh, again, if if you may advise your client to do it, but if it didn't get captured on the return, it did not happen. They did not get the tax benefit from it. So that's definitely one we see with some frequency, actually. I certainly saw it in my days as an advisor that uh, the tax preparers would miss that. And then I'll also say that um, Schedule 1, if you scroll down, Ben, like that line 24, that used to be just an other adjustments line, and now it's all broken out. This stuff is even more obscure than the stuff on the income side of the ledger. But again, it's like if you see anything in those, uh, that's probably a conversation starter. And yeah. So actually, somebody asked a question. I think this is helpful related to the HSA, and this is one that comes up all the time. So the question was, if an HSA is done by payroll deduction, would there still be an entry on line 13 of Schedule 1? No, right? And that's because uh, HSA contributions that are done through payroll also avoid FICA. So you know, to take the deduction twice, both through payroll deduction and on Schedule 1, would be double dipping. So what you see on schedule one is just gonna be out of pocket contributions to your HSA beyond what you might've put in through payroll deduction, right? And that's all gonna be captured on its own special form, which is a form 8889, right? That's a deep cut right there, Ben. I know, somebody somebody asked a good, yeah, well, it's a great year. Uh, So schedule two, this is again, I said this was a bad one is because this is where we're gonna have to pay a little bit more. So we've got everybody's favorite. The alternative minimum tax is going to be the one just sitting there right up there on top. Um, Clients are terrified of alternative minimum tax. I've learned advisors are terrified of alternative (laughs) minimum tax. Um, This is beyond the scope of today. It's not always as bad as it sounds. 
Um, and there can sometimes be some interesting planning opportunities. But if you see something here, that means that you know something funky is going on with your client's tax return and they've qualified for this always fun AMT club to be in. Um, and so our responsibility is to demystify. I mean, that's that's kind of the third obligation when you're doing a, a tax return. You know, check for errors, check for future planner op planning opportunities. And then the third obligation we have as advisors is how can I demystify this horribly designed document and extract information that is human, uh, that can be understood by my human clients. And when they see AMT, you're right, they freak out. Yeah. We have to provide us some assurance as to like, here's how it works. Here's why it's not such a big deal. Or is a big deal, you know, depending yeah, on the sometimes situation. it is a big deal, right? That, that's that does right. happen, right? You know, we, yeah, we sometimes true. tease about the AMT and sometimes it is a very big deal, but sometimes sometimes there's nothing you can do about it. But other times if there are planning strategies that you might be able to employ to avoid it, it's worth talking about. Uh, row two on schedule D, this is where this is related to ACA stuff where if you've got too much of a credit and your income was too high, you have to pay some of it back. So, you know, can we control income in 2022 to avoid that if possible? Um, part two is other taxes. So self-employment tax in row four. Um, some of these other ones are relatively small, although it's interesting, you know, line nine. Um, I was thinking about this one as we were putting this together. We don't call this out all that much, but I think the increase in number of people who have employed household help over the course of the pandemic has gone up. So it's just a reminder, if you have like nannies or, you know, just be mindful that anything where you pay a household employee more than $1,900, uh, you actually have to report taxes for that. So the employment taxes, you know, for FICA related things. So just, I'm curious to see if that starts coming up more and more now. Um, rows 11 and 12 though, lines 11 and 12, those are going to be the ones that most folks are familiar with. These are the extra Medicare related taxes. So the additional Medicare tax on excess wages is row 11. And then the net investment income tax, that 3.8% sur surtax on investment income is going to be reported here, but it's going to be calculated on its own separate form with 8960. Um, and then I think I think that was it for Schedule 2. Am I right, Roger? Am I, am yeah, right? there's, there's, there's some more little HSA stuff. A couple stuff. things on the, yeah, some yeah, small the, HSA related things. But again, again, here's this huge laundry list of stuff that used to be collapsed and has right. not been expanded. Right. So again, it's one of those things where now, now that we have all that obscure stuff. If you actually see any entry in any of those lines under 17, that's probably worth an additional conversation. For sure. Yeah. Okay. We're almost at the end of our numbered schedules, which means according to the rules of Sesame Street, we start getting to talk about the letters. But mm -hmm. uh, so schedule three is credits and payments. So part one is going to be all the non-refundable credits. You know, some of the more common ones that you see foreign tax credit in line one, Credit for child and dependent care expenses, line two, education credits, um, residential energy credits. I think that the, the um, so two things just on the first rows one through five, you know, row two, the credit for child and dependent care expenses, this is going to change from 2021 to 2022. Well, it's, so what it, you see here. Yeah, what's well, actually refundable in 2021, but I think in some cases, there's some funkiness with the rules in 2021, where I think like if you have foreigner, if you take the foreigner and income exclusion, some of those credits that are refundable are in fact treated as non-refundable. So that's why you're like, yeah. wait, I thought that was refundable this year. Um, I'll admit, I don't know all the details of when you would have a, a value in line two, but it's going to be Not something sure. funky like that. Yeah. But it is true, like starting in 2022, that's going to go back to the way it was, where that's definitely a non-refundable credit. Yeah, so line three, that's going to be education credit. So related to the American Opportunity Credit or the Lifetime Learning Credit, and there's going to be associated forms with that. Um, you know, row five, this is one that as we're seeing people doing modeling for future scenarios, you know, this residential energy credit will show up. It's just going to be important if you're thinking about how I'm going to use last year relative to this year. Some of these things might have just been one-time deals. And so just assuming the same level of credits year to year isn't necessarily going to be the right strategy, right? If you did these windows last year, you can't get credit for them again, right? Um, related to the residential energy credit. Um, I think the one that we wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about, Roger, was row 6B, right? The credit for the prior year minimum tax. And I can see you already making Good your luck. uncomfortable face. I can't help you much on that one. So this is a situation where if you paid alternative minimum tax in a pre or yeah, if you paid AMT in a previous year, you get this credit that you can use in future years 
to apply when your standard tax exceeds the tentative minimum tax, which is technically what you're calculating on that 6251 page. And the difference between those two is supposed to be your AMT, right? Well, if you pay AMT one year because your tentative minimum tax exceeded your standard tax, you get this credit. In a future year, when it flips and your standard tax is above your tentative minimum tax, you can use this prior year credit to equalize the two, right? So you can bring, you effectively bring your standard tax down to the level of your tentative minimum tax, but no lower, which is why it works as a non-refundable credit. Just important conceptually to keep in mind, there could be things that you do that impact the calculation for tentative minimum tax that don't result in paying AMT, but that do eat away at this credit. So in its way, that is effectively by reducing the amount of this credit that you can use, you're increasing your client's tax bill. So that can be complicated. Hopefully we'll have some more holistic plan related stuff related to that, but just be mindful of that because um, that can be that can be tricky. Ben, I, I understand it 100% now. Good. After that, I, I was at zero and now I'm at 100%. Yeah, I could easily teach the section on that, <laughs> on that line now. That's all I'm going for. Hey, I, I, let me just note something. I, I saw some chat back and forth. You know, what's this line? What's that line? When we were talking earlier about Magi and you know Magi call, you know phase outs of when your Magi is too high and how do you calculate Magi? That that comes into play with a lot of these credits, right? I mean, like that's you know, for example, the dependent care credit, the the retirement savings credit, the savers credit, whatever it's called. Um, those are based on those magis. And so th that's why having that at the ready. So, you, so then when you get to this page, you're able to say, well, wait a minute, if we had just done this, or if we had just maxed out the 401k, look what we could have done. We could have max, we could have broken open more dependent care uh, credit, for example. Absolutely. So that's kind of what the, where the rubber hits the road as far as that magi stuff goes. Okay. Um, let's get to Schedule A, we've hit the letters. Wasn't there a page two of, is there, there a page is, two? but we don't have a whole bunch of stuff on page two as That's far as- That's the refundable tax. credits? Yeah, so this is gonna be like your net premium tax credit. And then some of these other ones are, again, these were expanded out. So there's there's not a lot, at least we're commonly seen on here. Net premium tax credit, I suppose, is the only one that shows up, right? So that's gonna be, again, related to um, ACA and Obamacare. I, 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 I'll highlight one thing, which is, you know, we talked earlier about, um, you know, if you let, let's say someone missed the charity on a standard deduction, it's like, is that worth refiling a return if they missed that? Nah, eh, probably not. But the, the it's pot, it's for someone with with kids, like especially like three or four kids, that child independent care credit that's only exists for 2021 can actually be pretty freaking anno uh, free annoying, pretty enormous, <laughs> and um. <laughs> And so that's something where, like, I don't know about you, Ben, but like for me, I don't really ever think about the dependent care credit because like, oh, it, you, you max out and then it gets phased out and there's only so much you can take. And so do I really work that hard to get the receipts for all the preschool and all the after school stuff? Whereas in 2021, the caps were enormous. We're talking like 10 times, I'm making up a number of eight to 10 times what it was. And so that's a situation where if they just kind of phoned it in as far as like reporting their dependent care expenses, the credit they may be way off on, and that may be enough to refile the return. So I think as an advisor, it's up to us to kind of at least look at that line. It was at 13 G. Is that what I'm seeing? Yeah. 13G. I actually don't know that this is related to that though. No, that's the, that's the, that's the one for this year. Is that the one? That's for this the year? refundable one. Is. The no, refundable one for this year. Okay, the refundable one this year yeah. is that 13G. And this is the only year where it's the case. And it's right. it could, could ten, potentially be very enormous. And so that's why I'm saying take a look at it. And if you're like, man, I don't know, they, this client has a bunch of kids. Their AGI is under the 150 or whatever it needs to be, 150,000. And I know they've got three of them in preschool. Why is it so low? I think it's just worth another look because it could be enough if you dig in to look at a, at a refile. So. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I'm yeah. I'm kind of at the edges of stuff, but you know, it it doesn't take long to just check check that number and kind of finger in the air estimate. Does this look right or not? Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Schedule A is where we get to the itemized deductions. You know, grouped broadly into medical and dental expenses, taxes, interest, and gifts. So you know, medical and dental expenses, you're still limited 
it's got to be anything over seven and a half percent. You know, we don't have anything, I think, on the checklist related to this, but I will throw in just a, a, a note that the list of available deductible medical and dental expenses is, is actually really big. So if you have clients, particularly older clients who are also making long-term care premium payments, um, sometimes it's worth it to go back and say, yeah, you have your receipts for everything. It's possible we can get a little bit of deduction on here. Um, but beyond that, again, it's pretty straightforward. Taxes you paid, still limited to this $10,000 cap for estate and local taxes. I think in some cases, Roger, there are like some state benefits related to bunching these into a particular year if you can. If you can, I mean, with the cap, it kind of, we had a good deal in Texas. You know, we don't have income tax, but we have pretty high property tax. And before the cap existed, we could bunch our property taxes into alternating years the way we do with charity, that that same uh, strategy we, people do with charity. Yeah. Um, you know, so some of these, because they've changed the, the, the caps for itemizing versus taking the standard, you know, the, some of the old time strategies don't necessarily work anymore or aren't as, aren't as powerful anymore. But um, so interest you paid, so is it going to be for mortgage interest as well as to um, investment interest? Um, there is no cap here. So, you know, if you've got mortgage interest and this investment interest, sometimes you can actually see a pretty high deduction, although... If I remember correctly, that investment interest has ended up being an AMT preference item, so kind of a double-edged sword. Um, when we get to four, uh, rows 11 through 14, we're looking at gifts to charity. And here, you know, in addition to just remembering what was available as a charitable deduction versus a standard, that's helpful. But, you know, you start to get to the, does it make sense to bunch charitable contributions in a given year? Right, because that was kind of the big thing that came out when all the limits were changed. Do we want a bunch of deductions, which sounds really good, but I think you have to really take a hard look and say, like, how much benefit are we truly getting for that? Right, how many years worth of deduction of contributions do we have to put in to eke out something? Because you're only getting a tax deduction for the next dollar over the standard deduction, right? So, you know, if you're only taking a $30,000 deduction and the standard deduction for a married couple is, you know, $26,000, $27,000. Like, that's not all that powerful in the long run, right? Until you can bunch them in, uh, into alternating years. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, really or, when you, you see know, questions about, you know, this is where you start thinking about qualified charitable distributions. If your client is over 70 and a half um, donor advised funds, you know, so this can cue some interesting conversations. Um, but, you know, again, with that higher standard deduction, you, this has to be a lot higher than it might have had to been like 10 years ago. Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay. Schedule B is where we do some, what I always think of, this happens to me every year, right? So this is where we start reporting interest and dividends in part one and part two respectively. But this is where you're going to find a clue of an account that a client just forgot to tell you about. Right. So every year or purposefully didn't tell you about. Yeah. <laughs> something shows up on here like, oh, I didn't know you had an account at Schwab. Um, tell me about that because I custody at Fidelity. So you know what? <laughs> um, I had a client who had there was a whole trust. There was income from a trust. And I was like, what? And he'd been with us for years. I was like, what is this? He's like, oh, yeah, I, I, I inherited. I'm a beneficiary of this trust and have been for like 40 years. I'm like, were you going to ever? Are we going to bring that up in any planning <laughs> conversations ever? Crazy. Nah. nah. Yeah. All right. So um, here's where we actually see Schedule C show up. And so with this sample return, we had somebody with Schedule C. So, you know, this is, we're not going to deep delve too deep into this because I want to make sure we get to all the other schedules where we're going to have our checklist. But, you know, helpful to look at income, maybe just take a glance at expenses, you know, look and see like, okay, was there something on row 17 for legal and professional services? You know, is there an opportunity to effectively get back the deduction that you used to take for having a CPA file your taxes, right? So if you work it through your business, you can deduct that expense from your gross income. Um, anything else, Roger, that we want to, to touch on related to this? Well, it's another one of these, like, kind of like what we just said on schedule B is like, I didn't know that you had this other third business that you didn't tell me about. Let's, let's talk about that. You know, like both in terms of the use of their time and energy from a kind of life planning perspective, uh, or is there an opportunity um, because they're, uh, you know, can you set up something for that business specifically? It's just, it's just good to know 
what they're up to. And Schedule C sometimes reveals things that they have to reveal to the government that they may have chosen not to reveal to you. Yeah. Or, and I'm always maybe a little bit more generous, forgotten, right? So Roger and I both used to work at firms with a, a high proportion of university professionals. And inevitably there'd be a, a professor that, you know, wrote a book 10 years ago and was still getting royalties off of it or did a speaking engagement and, you know, $10,000 just sort of showed up. Like, oh, okay, well, maybe we can do some other retirement plan with that. Yeah, great point. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good example. Like we have professors and they don't even think of the consulting as a business, you know? Yeah. So it gets reported on Schedule C and you're like, well, did you know that we could maybe do some interesting things with this quote unquote business that you're doing here? And Or did you spend any money to generate that income? Like, right. You right, probably right. did, right? So for sure. Uh, Schedule D is where we start reporting short and long-term capital gains. So short-term capital gains are going to be in part one. Uh, long-term capital gains are going to be in part two. Here, you know, at least the, the guidance from a return re a review checklist is still consistent as it always has been. If there are short-term gains, why are they there, right? You know, because those are the more expensive ones since those are taxes, ordinary income. Are those generated as realized gains or are they from mutual fund distributions? Are there investment portfolio decisions that we can make there to try to, you know, eke out a greater after-tax return, right? Um, the second page of this is where we start breaking out what's the total net gain. Was there going to be a loss that's carried forward? Uh, rows 18 and 19 will sometimes show up. So row 18 will be for collectibles, which get their own special tax treatment. Row 19, so unrecaptured section 1250 gain, this is for depreciation recapture, which will also be taxed differently. So it still counts as capital gains, but it's actually going to be taxed as ordinary income up until you hit the point of 25%, at least for, uh, for real estate um, depreciation recapture. Uh, a note about the collectibles thing that includes if you own an ETF that uh, like a gold ETF, like GLD. And I think a lot of people, uh, I know a lot of people, including tax preparers don't think of it that way, but my understanding is don't quote me on this, that GLD and I can't remember the other IAU or whatever they are. Those are in fact taxed as collectibles at 28%. Yep. Um, the better tax preparers and certainly the best tax, the better tax prepared softwares will include the qualified dividends and capital gain worksheet. If you look at that, you'll actually be able to see how much of your capital gains and qualified dividends were taxed at zero, 15 and 20% respectively. Schedule E is where we report supplemental income and loss. So predominantly this is gonna be rental real estate and royalties, but also um, partnership income. So we've given this, client a, uh, a rental property in uh, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. So we can see here, they got $15,000 of rent, $23,000 of expenses. So it looks like a really bad loss, but most of that expense came from depreciation. So just, I think the, 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 the guidance here is you can take a look at this and determine, is this a profitable activity, both on paper and in real life, right? You know, sometimes depreciation by itself can be a really good tax saving strategy, but with the remembrance that yeah, you're going to have to pay it back eventually, right? Clever uh, street name, by the way. Do I, 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 I saw it. Yeah. By the way, um, on schedules, what was it? Schedule D, someone was like, where's the, where's the carry forward? What was it? Line 19? I can't, I don't remember offhand. 16. Can you go back? Yeah. The, the, my only point on that is um, our job as a financial advisor is to have a note of that. We need to make sure that we have a central place where we're recording carry forward losses, the, the total carried forward loss. So like on whatever, whatever it is, 21, right? Oh, is that the what? Oh yeah, sorry. You do the 3, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you actually you strip that out from this 16. Number. So 16 is where you get the, the total loss and then you, you subtract out the 3000. And so it's up to us to store that somewhere. So that's at our fingertips throughout the year. And especially at the end of the year when we're making trades. So I don't think we all want to be like thumbing back through tax returns to get that number. So this is the time to be putting that in a central place for people. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, the second and third parts for Schedule E, we're looking at income or loss from partnerships and estates and trusts. Um, again, not much, I don't think guidance wise here, because these can be really complicated uh, <laughs> equations for sure, but just the existence of something here right. is helpful to know, right? So, you know, there's still some folks that are still stuck with oil and gas partnerships from before 1986, which, you know, that's when the rules on these things change. But just knowing that these things are there 
sometimes clients will forget that they have them. And then you have to bring them up and like, oh yeah, that's the thing we bought 20 years ago. And we still get this K1 every once in a while for like 20 bucks. Yep. Well, we still have to know about it. So um, this is where you're going to find out about it more often than not. All right. I think, so we, we included uh, self-employment tax in here, the, the schedule. I don't think we have anything specific on our checklist because this is a pretty straightforward calculation. Um, although it can be more complicated once you start including the always popular farm income. Yeah. yeah. So schedule 8812, this is where uh, Roger was talking about before, you know, just how powerful this document can be now for the child tax credit that is, at least for last year, is going to be refundable. Um, I think the bigger guidance here, not just that it's refundable, but that we had the advance payments coming in. So what this page effectively works as now is both a calculation of the credit itself but also the reconciliation between the advance payment credit and the actual calculation of your credit with the difference of those two potentially having tax impacts, right? If your advance payment and your actual credit are equal, you're not gonna see anything on the tax return, right? Even though it's a credit, you're not gonna see anything because you already got the money. But if your calculated credit exceeds what you received, you're gonna get an additional credit that's gonna show up on the tax return. And if your calculated credit, um, is less than what you received, which you're is great. not ideal, uh, <laughs> you're going to have to pay a little bit back, right? You've That's... been talking for an hour, man. You're doing great, man. You think I'll, so? I'll say this. So what, what Ben said is really, really important. Your client may have received a child tax credit, but on Form 1040, there could be nothing, zero. And so this revamped, this is, this is newly designed for 2021, this 8812 schedule, that's got all the detail you need. So honestly, just don't even look at 1040 to try to figure out what's going on with child tax credits. Go straight to 8812. That's got the breakout of who's under six or over six. We want to make sure they got that right. It's got your credit for other dependents. It's got the advanced payments. We're seeing these rumors that these letters are not coming back 100% accurate from the IRS. I hope that that's just internet rumors, but that letter, what's it called? 6419 letter? 6419. It just, it just rolls off the tongue. That's a snappy <laughs> name they came up for it. Um, Can you imagine the 6,400 letters that preceded it though? Yeah, I, 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 I'm collecting them all. I'm doing my best. But like there are rumors of that not being 100% accurate for people. I don't know if that's true or not, but so our job is going to be to really dig in on this 8812. I think for every client with kids, we're going to have to check it really closely. Yeah, and so the, those rumors being you're getting a letter that says you got this much, but your bank account says you got something else. Right. So precisely. Yeah. One, one other, one more fun thing to think about. And I, and I think that that letter comes up on line 14 F. I mean, this is all on our checklist, but line 14 F and then also line 30 on the last page is line 14 F is the dollar amount. Line 30 is the number of children they use to compute it. So yeah, I think it's line 30 doesn't them. always apply though. They don't so even, line, they, yeah, they don't always even include that, those pages. You're right. Line 30. That's when, that's when you've received more than you were. Right supposed to yeah so it's very it's pretty likely in fact that you may not even see pages two or three of that form that's right. 12. uh form 8606 this is going to be always popular because as long as we're allowed to do roth conversions especially when there's bases in them which you know thought that might not be allowed this year but back on the table um, this is the only spot that you've got to keep track of basis inside of an IRA. So this would be for a non-deductible contribution. I, you know, I think our guidance is always, you want to file this every year, right? Even if you don't have any contributions or nothing's impacting it, because this is the best way to keep track of all these sorts of things. Um, you've got to do it per taxpayer too. So in this case, I think only one person of this couple has a form 8606, but if the spouse also had non-deductible contributions in there or basis, you're going to have to have it separated for taxpayer one and taxpayer two. Um, one thing that, you know, I would see regularly and continue to see is that, you know, row seven through 12, which is where you do this calculation of how much is taxable, something would be wrong here. Right. So, you know, if you know that you did a a, a conversion where there was basis, you can look at this and say, like, well, if the contribution and the taxable amount are exactly the same, but there was basis, somebody did something wrong somewhere. Right. Um, I say I said contribution, I meant conversion. 
I would, I would just say, I mean, if there's one takeaway from this whole thing, and I think we're in the home stretch now. We are. We are. <laughs> this, this, talk about one screw up on the return causing the best laid plans to be completely thrown out the window. Form 8606. I mean, on, I mean, I don't know, Ben, I, if, I may be overstating it, but it's almost as bad as like the social security thing. Like I almost went into tax returns expecting it to be not be filed at all or to be filed incorrectly, or they didn't have the basis. So they made hundred percent of my backdoor Roth IRA taxable. I just felt like 8606 was so wrong or so missing <laughs> so often that I think that's something that, I mean, we absolutely need to check for it every year and we need to drill it into, I think, yeah, I think it should be filed every year, whether we, do a reconversion or not. I think we ought to ask for it at least, you know? Yeah. So, so if you're, if you're an advisor who's in the habit of doing, you know, the non-deductible, non-deductible contributions followed by the conversion somewhere, or if you're doing any sort of Roth conversion, or if you know that your client has basis in an IRA and they're just taking a distribution, it's got to be on your, on your internal checklist or the checklist that you're using to say, I have to make sure that 8606 is there so that my client doesn't pay unnecessary taxes. Right. Because that's what this is all getting at. So that your right. client doesn't effectively get taxed twice. Yeah. Right. Or lose. Okay. We're just getting angry about it. But uh, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> or, or, you, know, you spend all this years building a basis and then he gets lost. I mean, it's just, it's just maddening how often yeah. that happens. So please, if you just remember one thing, remember to look at 8606. Yeah. For uh, so everybody. somebody asked, you know, can 8606 be filed retroactively if it was missing prior years? The answer is yes. You can go back and file an amended return. And in fact, you know, you'd be, I, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I think there's almost, is there, well, again, Roger already said, don't quote me, which is always fun to say, but I think there's even a penalty for not reporting basis correctly when you're supposed to, I could be completely. Oh, interesting. Out of them. So, but yes, yeah, you can, you can retroactively file this. Yeah. I'm trying to think of, I, I never, I, honestly, I never had a, a case personally where it was so bad that we had to go back and figure out how to clean it up. I, for me, it was usually, well, as far as I know, you know, if someone had right. basis from 10 years ago and then they joined us as a client, you know, it could have been lost forever. But it's certainly the time that I was working with people, we would catch it, fix it that year. Um, yeah, I don't have firsthand experience with how to go back and fix it. That's probably going to be need to talk to a tax professional about the best way to approach that problem. Yep. So I think the last uh, form that we've got, at least on our checklist, aside from some miscellaneous stuff, is Form 8889, and this was related to health savings accounts. There was that question that came in earlier about, you know, how do we reconcile this with um, contributions made through payroll? Well, this is where it happens, right? So if you look here, row line nine is where employer contributions made to your HSAs, and I think there's somewhere else about cafeteria contributions, right? So HSA contributions you made. Um, but it says, do not include employer contributions, contributions through a cafeteria plan or rollovers, right? So this is where you're getting into the fact of, yeah, you might've contributed to it, but you're not going to get another deduction for it if you already did it through payroll, right? Second part is for distributions. I think the planning takeaway for me has always been A, the hard one, which is row 16, were there any taxable HSA distributions, right? Because usually if that happened, something bad happened, right? If this is a source of needing to get money out. We've really tapped some resources if we're having to pay tax on the HSA distribution. But you know, taking a step above that, if there were any distributions from the HSA, could those have been paid from another source? The reason for that, while you can take out HSA uh, or health savings account balances to pay for qualified medical expenses and not have to pay any taxes on the distribution, these are great accumulation vehicles for folks that can't afford to pay out of pocket for some of the things on here. So if you see small distributions coming out of here and you know your clients are sitting on you know tens of thousand dollars in cash, maybe that's the conversation about, you know, if we keep it in here, this is a triple tax-free account, tax deductible going in, tax deferred, and then tax-free if we take it out the right way. Is there another way we can pay for that same expense? Right. That bottle of aspirin, just pay out of pocket. Don't pay <laughs> the HSA for it. I don't and think we you, need to spend our band-aid money on this. Did you talk about line nine, the employer contributions? I mean, I referenced it, but I think you probably want to talk a little bit more about it. So that. If, if, if we're trying to figure out if the client maxed out, take line nine plus line, whatever it was on schedule one and line nine for both spouses, potentially, that's how we're going to determine if there's any room left uh, to make, a, to make a, a more deductible contribution, see if they're maxing out. That's right. 
Um, I think the last part on our actual checklist, there's some miscellaneous things that relate to, you know, did the, did the return include a gift tax return, right? So did your client effectively make a taxable gift that needs to be reported? Is there an opportunity maybe to do split gifting if there were spouses involved? Is the estate just in general above federal or estate tax limits? Or are there some conversations you need to have there? Um, I think my takeaway, because you're not always going to see it, but if your return, your client's return has statements, that's always, right? Statements are where all the information really is. That's where you want to look at stuff, right? Because that'll break out, even though wages is reported as just one lump sum, a good statement will say, well, this is how much was attributable to taxpayer one versus taxpayer two. You'll maybe see all of the different uh, charitable contributions on a statement, and that can be your clue to have, hey, is there a more efficient way for us to do charitable giving as opposed to giving like $1,500 checks? Can we do this in a slightly more efficient way? Um, so always take a look at the statements, right? I think that's always a, a good one. Um, Scott asked, do the custodians track IRA basis? And I, I don't think so, because they don't know. Yeah, right? I don't think they can take a view as to whether your, your contribution was deductible or not. Right. Um, Kent asked, can you discuss proper reporting for RSU vesting? It seems to be a consistent problem with matching basis. So um, you want to do that, Ben? It's 103 right now. It's 103. So Kent, I'll say, yeah, I'm not exactly sure, but if that's a question that you have, maybe we can report it elsewhere. You know, RSUs, as they vest, are supposed to just be reported as uh, compensation income. So it should just be reported on line one. Um, now, whether or not that's being tracked appropriately, that's going to be, I think, the responsibility of the RSU custodian. So whichever company your client's employer is using to manage their RSU program. Um, but yeah, we uh, we covered a lot here in in sixty minutes, Roger. This is fun. I, I miss doing this with you. So maybe we can do it again next year. Uh, next year, or I was going to say five years from now. We'll just do this every five years, so our own version of the Olympics. But we can do it next year. Well, I think they. I mean, they tax laws seem to be fluid right now, and the design of the forms is fluid. And so our job as advisors is to make sure that we stay up to date on the design of these things. Make sure we're finding those little hidden nuggets that may not have been there in previous years. Update our checklists. Obviously, our job at Holista Plan is to make sure the software can read in these new forms like Form 8812, which is new this year. We were able to pull some new stuff out of that. So, you know, that's just part of the fun of being an advisor is it's a moving target. And we keep our skills sharp and we do a good job for clients. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you, everybody, for your time. We appreciate all the questions that came in. And again, you know, we recorded the session. We'll send out a copy of the video when we put it through our editing process, along with the link to the actual um, checklist that Roger and I have referenced throughout the hour. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate all the attention that you paid to us so far, and we'll see everybody soon. Take care. Bye.